first you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie... What's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year 10. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the 23rd to the 26th, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, uh, actually, I think it's the 24th to the 27th. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So... Well, I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but... Suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So, what have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching, and I think I found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and... Is that the campsite in the Lake District? No. Actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool, and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking, and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening, and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid five pounds a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid ten pounds for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only four pounds per night. And they told me that if we had over 50 children, which we do, they could give us a further 10% off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. I've made a few notes. OK, so, now, these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes, go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around 7 on Friday evening. It'll still be light then, and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At 8, we could have a barbecue, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs, something that's nice and easy to prepare. And that children love. Yes. Then, lights out would be at 9.30, so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at 7 on Saturday morning. Breakfast would be at 7.30, an hour's hiking from 8 till 9, and then a couple of hours at the lake. That would take us up to 11. I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know? Yes, 
Great idea. And then? Let's see. A picnic lunch at 12, and then sports in the afternoon till 4. Another swim until 5, and then supper. After clean-up, around 6.30, we could have a talk-back session, where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing-along at 8, back to the tents at 9.30, and, well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right. As on Saturday, same wake-up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp, which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim, and then lunch at one. Then we could have organized games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six and all set to head back into the city. Well now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie, and it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You are going to hear a talk about making the most of graduate school. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Entrance to the graduate school. My job now is to give you the graduate school survival guide and make some concise suggestions for getting the most out of your relationship with our research supervisor, getting the most out of what you read, and making continual progress with your research. First, your relationship with your supervisor. This is fundamental. Meet regularly. You should expect to meet once a week or at least every other week because this will give you the motivation to make progress and also keeps your advisor aware of your work. Prepare for your meetings. Come to each meeting. Also, bring the notes from your previous meeting together with a list of any upcoming deadlines. Make a plan for what you hope to get out of each meeting. After the meeting, email your supervisor a brief summary. Include a list of major topics discussed, a list of what you agreed on, a note of any advice you may not want to follow, and a new summary of what you are planning to do. This helps avoid misunderstandings and provides a handy record of the progress of your research. Add a to-do list for yourself and your supervisor, including a reading list. Finally, add the time and date for the next meeting. My second main piece of advice is to keep your supervisor informed. Show him or her the results of your work as soon as possible. 
This helps your supervisor understand your research and identify any potential points of conflict early in the process. Include summaries of your work, including any results of experiments, and also anything you write about your research. Thirdly, communicate clearly. If you disagree with your advisor, state your objections and concerns clearly and calmly. If you feel that something about your relationship is not working, discuss it with him or her. Whenever possible, suggest steps that they could take to address your concerns. Under this heading, it is extremely important to take the initiative. You do not need to clear everything you do in your research with your advisor. He or she is busy too. You must be responsible for your own ideas and the progress of your work. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. The second section of my talk is about getting the most out of what you read. The first principle here is to be organized. Keep an electronic bibliography with notes and pointers to the paper files. Keep and file all the papers you have read. Point two, be efficient. Only read what you need to. Start by reading only the conclusion, scanning figures and tables, and looking at their references. Read the other sections only if the paper seems relevant or you think it might help you get a different perspective. Skip the sections you think you already understand. These are often the background and motivation sections. It's of critical importance to take good notes on every paper you find worth reading. Note especially what problem the author is trying to solve, what approach they take to the problem, and how their approach differs from other approaches. Next, summarize what you have read on each topic. After you have read several papers on the same topic, note the key problems, the various formulations of the problem under consideration, the relationship between the various approaches and the alternative approaches you come across. Let me add one point you might not have already thought of. Read PhD theses. Even though they are long, they can be very helpful for quickly learning about what has been done in your field of interest. Focus particularly on the background sections and method sections. Don't forget to read your advisor's thesis. This will give you an idea of what he or she expects from you. The third section of my talk is about making continual progress with your research. Keep a journal of your ideas. Write down every issue you are thinking about, even if you think it is stupid. This will help you keep track of your progress and keep you from going round in circles. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students, Amanda and Jake. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. So, Jake and Amanda, how did the project go? Very well, I think, Doctor Hinton. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed myself at the same time. Me too. So, remind me, what was your project about? Basically, what makes successful people, let's call them top achievers, successful? Yes. How are they different from us? What do they do that other less successful people don't do? Interesting. And did you come to any conclusions? Quite a few, actually. Good. Share some with me then. Well, I'd always thought that a top achiever would be the sort of person who would bring work home every night and slave over it, but it appears not. Those types tend to peak early and then go into decline. They become addicted to work itself, with much less concern for results. We found that high achievers were certainly ready to work hard, but within strict limits. They knew how to relax, could leave their work at the office, prize close friends and family life, and spend a healthy amount of time with their children and friends. There's a lesson for us all there. Anyway, go on. It's also very important to choose a career which you enjoy, not just one that pays well or which assures you of a pension many years down the line. Surely that's important, though, Amanda. Yes, I agree. But being happy in your work is far more important than anything else. Top achievers spend over two thirds of their working hours on doing work they truly prefer. And only one third on disliked chores. They want internal satisfaction, not just external rewards such as pay rises and promotions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Actually, in the end, they often have both, because they enjoy what they are doing, so their work is better and their rewards higher. Yes, Jake, that certainly makes sense. Now, can I ask you something? Do high achievers, as you call them, take many risks? Yes and no. I interviewed one business executive, who told me he was able to take risks because he carefully considered how he could salvage the situation if it all went wrong. He imagined the worst that could happen, and if he could live with that, he went ahead. If not, he didn't take the chance. Other people prefer to stay in what I heard described as the comfort zone setting for security, even if it means settling for mediocrity and boredom too. Would you call top achievers perfectionists? Contrary to what I expected, no, I wouldn't. We came to the conclusion that a lot of ambitious and hardworking people are so obsessed with perfection that they actually turn out very little work. I happen to know a university teacher, a friend of my mother's, who has spent over ten years preparing a study about a playwright. She is so worried that she has missed something. She still hasn't sent the manuscript to a publisher. Meanwhile, the playwright, who was at the height of his fame when the project began, has faded from public view. The woman's study, even if finally published, will interest few people. So, what has this got to do with top achievers? Well. Top achievers are almost always free of the compulsion to be perfect. They don't think of their mistakes as failures. Instead, they learn from them, so they can do better next time. Hmm. Well, would you call them competitive? High performers focus more on bettering their own previous efforts than on beating competitors. In fact, I, or we. 
came to the conclusion that worrying too much about competitors' abilities and possible superiority can be self-defeating. Yes, and we found that top achievers tend to be team players rather than loners. They recognise that groups can solve certain complicated problems better than individuals, and are eager to let other people do part of the work. Yes, loners who are often over concerned about rivals can't delegate important work or decision making. Their performance is limited because they must do everything themselves. Well, it looks as if you two have done a thorough job. And learn something into the bargain too. Now there are just a couple of points I'd like to clarify with you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an environmental studies student giving a presentation about his project on saving an endangered species of plant. Now you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. For my presentation, I'm going to summarise what I've found out about efforts to save one plant species, the juniper bush. It once flourished in Britain and throughout the world's temperate zones, but over the last few decades has declined considerably. Before I go on to explain the steps being taken to save it in England, let me start by looking at some background information and why the juniper has been so important in cultural as well as ecological terms historically and in the present day. Firstly, I want to emphasise the fact that juniper is a very ancient plant. It has been discovered that it was actually amongst the first species of plants to establish itself in Britain in the period following the most recent ice age, and as I say, it has a much valued place in British culture. It was used widely as a fuel during the Middle Ages, because when burnt, the smoke given off is all but invisible, and so any illicit activities involving fire could go on without being detected. For example, cooking game hunted illegally. It also has valuable medicinal properties, particularly during large epidemics. Oils were extracted from the juniper wood and sprayed in the air to try to prevent the spread of infection in hospital wards. And these days, perhaps its most well-known use is in cuisine, cooking, where its berries are a much valued ingredient. Used to flavour a variety of meat dishes and also drinks. Turning now to ecological issues, juniper bushes play an important role in supporting other living things. If juniper bushes are wiped out, this would radically affect many different insect and also fungus species. We simply cannot afford to let this species die out. So why is the juniper plant declining at such a rapid rate? Well, a survey conducted in the north and west of Britain in 2004 to 5 showed that a major problem is the fact that in present-day populations, ratios between the sexes are unbalanced, and without a proper mix of male and female, bushes don't get pollinated. Also, the survey found that in a lot of these populations, the plants are the same age, 
So this means that bushes grow old and start to die at similar times, leading to swift extinction of whole populations. Now, the charity Plant Life is trying to do something to halt the decline in juniper species. It's currently trying out two new major salvage techniques, this time focusing on lowland regions of England. The first thing it's trying is to provide shelters for the seedlings in areas where juniper populations are fairly well established. These, of course, are designed to help protect the plants at their most vulnerable stage. A further measure is that in areas where colonies have all but died out, numbers are being bolstered by the planting of cuttings which have been taken from healthy bushes elsewhere. Now, I hope I've given a clear picture of the problems facing this culturally and ecologically valuable plant and of the measures being taken by plant life to tackle them. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.